and kind of, you know, been here with us now for two years running and uh, he's going to teach us more about Orthodox uh, iconography. Excuse me, two minutes, two questions. Ventura, Ventura Boulevard, just get off the freeway, go south of the free of the 101, oh wait, the 101, yeah, the 101, go south of the 101, you know, on the, like, the, the city side. Oh, take Ventura Boulevard. It's, it's just, you just uh, make a right turn and then a left. You should be able to see it on your map. It's, it comes out that far to where you are, practically. So you just have to go, it goes parallel to the freeway, but it's on the south side of the freeway, okay? Ventura Boulevard is like, if you're facing the ocean, it's on the left. You'll go under the, the 101, and because the 101 curves around. So you just have to put, um, yeah, put no, put on your, on your map that you don't want to take the freeway for right now. And I'll take you. Probably on onto uh, okay. You'll go under the 101 spins. Yeah, just go over it and head toward the ocean, and it's on the left side of the freeway. The street is on the left of the freeway. Okay. <coughs> yeah, I would. All right, we're gonna start the lecture now. That's right, sweet. Just oh. one minute. I'm sorry. You have to help. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that phone call either. Uh, see if I can keep going. Okay. Okay, can we start? Okay, uh, <coughs> uh, the lecture is divided into uh, parts. In the first part, uh, uh, I talk about the history of iconography through the centuries. And uh, in the second part about the philosophy, the meaning, the symbolism, and the artistic te techniques used by Byzantine iconographers. Um, first, I would like to to make a reference um, in the uh, in the etymology of the words icon and iconography. So you can look at the script. Um, the word icon. Yes. The word icon etymologically comes from the Greek word uh, icon, which derives from the verb icon, which means likeness, uh, namely an imprint of the characteristics of the prototype. This means that the icon does not have its own hypostasis, but its value exists in the likeness with the prototype. The word iconography means icon painting 
and it is a compound word containing the words icon and graphy, which both are Greek. The second word graphy comes graphy uh, uh, comes from the Greek uh, graphy, which means writing. Thus, iconography is the writing of the icons. An iconographer then is one who paints or writes an icon according to the Greek root words. But of course, in English, we would always say that an iconographer paints an icon because that is correct uh, in English. Now, one can correctly say iconographer in English because the word has long been adopted into English as have many words of Greek origin. Uh, ecclesiastic tradition mentions that the first icon with the essence of the representation was made by the Lord himself and in fact without hands. The story of this icon uh, briefly is as follows. The king of Edes of Mesopotamia, Abgarus, suffered from, lep from, from leprosy. He wrote therefore to the Lord a letter in which he implored him to visit Edes and heal him. His servant Ananias brought the letter to Palestine. He tried to draw the, uh, the Lord, but it did, but did not succeed. The Lord had noticed the effort of Ananias, asked for water to wash his face with, with he then dried with a handkerchief. The holy face of the Lord was miraculously imprinted on the handkerchief, and this is uh, known as the holy mandilion or the holy napkin. Abgar, to kick Abgarus, as a mark of his gratitude for his healing, which happened through the grace of the icon, and completed the letter with his, with his baptism, raised the icon of Holy Mandilion at the entrance of the city's gate, having first written the plank underneath it the phrase, Christ, God, whoever hopes in you, never fails. The icon of the Lord made with no hands after quite a few centuries in Edessa, was brought in, the, in, in 1994 to Constantinople. Tradition also mentions, as the first iconographer, the Evangelist Luke. The Evangelist, the Evangelist Luke was the first to draw, to, draw, uh, to draw three icons of the Holy Mother, holding in her, in her bosom our Lord Jesus Christ, and offered them to her, wishing to know if they were pleasing to her. The Mother of God, of Lord accepted them, saying, The grace of the one who drew me goes through me to them. The history of the Bible iconography uh, is divided by historians to various, various periods. In the first centuries of Christianity, uh, the proto-Christian period was what was known as the archaic iconography, which had a symbolic characteristic also known as the art of the catacombs. The purpose of this art was plainly educational. The wall paintings of this period were, were basically non-artistic. They had more religious than artistic significance. When Christianity was no longer a forbidden religion, Christian art left the catacombs and moved rapidly into creating its own art, its, its own form of expression. After the victory of Emperor Constantine over Maxentius, in the year 312, Christianity is recognized as, as a state religion. Constantine the Great commanded the construction of many beautifully designed and decorated churches. Indifferent to art until now, the church becomes the strongest propagator of artistic expression, both in architecture and in image representations. Having great wealth coming from the state and also from the, from the princes themselves, the church has the opportunity to create and develop a separate form of art, the Christian art. In the year 330, Constantine the Great transferred the ancient imperial capital from Rome to the ancient Greek city of Byzantium, located on the easternmost territory, uh, territory of the European continent. The emperor, the, emperor, the emperor renamed this ancient port city Constantinople, which means the city of Constantine. The Christian, ultimately Greek-speaking state, rooted from that, from that city, would come to be called Byzantium. Byzantium was the cross road between east and west. It had its capital at Constantinople, the meeting point of Europe and Asia. Too well attached to the political and social institutions of the later Roman Empire, 
it evolved the new ecumenical religion, Christianity, spoke the Greek language and adopted the Greek education. In the sixth century, the Western half of the Roman Empire was slowly collapsing. Classical culture was constantly being interrupted by invading German tribes. Rome has Ro uh, Rome had long since ha Rome had had long since ceased to hold any real political power. Thus, while thus while Western Christendom uh, fell into the cultural abyss uh, abyss uh, of the barbarian Dark Ages, its religious, secular, and artistic values were maintained by its new Eastern capital in Byzantium. Along with the transfer of imperial authority to Byzantium, went thousands of Roman and Greek painters and craftsmen who proceeded to create a new set of Eastern Christian images and icons known as Byzantine art. Byzantine art flourished uh, through the empire as mosaics, wall paintings, and portable icons. It became most fully developed and widely spread in the, in the empire in the sixth century under the rule of Justinian the Great. In the, in the Byzantine Empire, classical culture carried on un uninterrupted for almost a thousand years until the fall and the, and the conquest of Constantinople by the Turks in the year 453. So, so as the West descended into the Dark Ages, Byzantine civilization continued to flourish and Constantinople became the cultural and artistic center of the early Christian world. The art of Byzantine iconography is distinguished by portable icons, wall paintings, mosaics, and micrography. I, pers I personally consider that uh, one of the most important events that marked the course of iconography was the destruction of religious icons for religious, dogmatic, and political reasons occurred during the iconoclast period in 8th and 9th century. The iconoclastic periods mark the history and life of the church. The first period, period of condemnation of icons as symbols of idolatry started with, the, started with the reign of Emperor Leo. Rejecting any representation of Christ and his saints, Emperor Leo felt that such images should not be objects of veneration. The Council of 754 agreed to a formal condemnation of the cult. During this time, painting as an art was never completely abandoned, with the exception of the sacred art. Sacred art, sacred art has been destroyed and desecrated by the icon class. The commotion of icon class ended decisively with the Synod of 843 in Constantinople during the reign, the reign of Saint Theodora. The Synod decided, the Synod decided to restore the holy icons and degrade the Sunday of Orthodoxy. This is one of the major events in one of the greatest feasts of the Orthodoxy of Orthodoxy, also known as the Sunday of Orthodoxy. In this image we can see an icon illustrating the restoration of the icons and the triumph of Orthodoxy under the Byzantine Empress Theodora and her son Michael over iconoclasm in the year 843. The second period in the development of Byzantine art is the one after the 9th century. In the following pe period, we have the renaissance of uh, iconography. The victory over the iconoclast brought about substantial change in painting as well as to the whole Byzantine art. The mural, the mural mosaics are without any doubt the most important in the peak of Byzantine art of all ages. A new art, from, a new art form is developing, however, and that is the art of the fresco. The fresco is a mural painting on a specially prepared plaster material. A totally, different, a totally different technique than the mosaic, the fresco allows the artist more flexibility and more creative behavior. Just as mosaic, the fresco was used mostly to decorate the churches. Along with the frescoes beginning with, with the 9th century, uh, we find also that the Byzantine piety is influencing greatly uh, the development of small-scale pieces, uh, icons uh, painted on wood. In this image, we see frescoes, uh, frescoes in, in LZ with its unique length 
blend of high tragedy, gender to humanity, and realism. It is considered a superb example of the 12th century art. This is, uh, uh, this is the image of Christ Pantocrator, the most famous of the surviving Byzantine mosaics of Saint Sophia in Constantinople that was made in the 12th century. The Paleologian uh, period is considered the golden age of iconography. The Paleologian period is uh, whatever the art of the previous centuries offered came back with a new life. The Renaissance of the Paleologus should be considered as, cons as, a, cons as a consequent natural progression of the previous years and not as a phenomenon that appears suddenly. <coughs> In this, uh, there is a turn towards the humanistic. Uh, there is a turn towards the humanistic iconography, becoming more narrative, with the art attempting to cause emotion to touch the feelings. The, the Paleologian are divided into schools: the Macedonian and the Greek. Of course, the term schools, which have since held, is not correct. Rather, it concerns it concerns two different currents, two different ways of approach of the iconography. The Macedonian school was born in Constantinople and bloomed mainly in Macedonia, centered in Thessaloniki, and passed on to Serbia. The school is characterized by its realism and freedom. It has intensity, movement, and rich colors. The face and clothes are broadly illuminated, and for this, they call it broad style. One of the main exponents was icon the iconographer Manuel Pansevinos, who drew the monastery of the Protaton in Holy Mount Athos. These murals are a unique example of the Macedonian school of painting and the most important works of the great master, Manuel Pansevinos. This cycle uh, of Christ Pantocrator painted by, painted by Manuel Pansevinos is considered as one of the most magnificent and admired artworks of Byzantine iconography. The, Cret uh, the Cretan school remains more faithful to the Byzantine idealism it is a conservative art with its characteristic conservative motions, a simplicity, and generally its attachment to the Byzantine tradition. It was considered as an art of monastic cycle. The genuine Cretan school was, was, was first form, formed in Crete, from which it derived its name after, <coughs> after the historically significant event of the fall of Byzantium and the conquest of Constantinople by the Turks in the 15th century. The main representative of Cretan school was the iconographer Theophan the Cretan. Uh, if the beginning of this period offers, offers us the excellent bloom of, of the Cretan school, the end of this preserves the death of iconography, or in fact the slow and steady penetration of Western folk elements that will completely change the character and the timeless values of the, of the art. During the Turkish and Venetian occupation, the artistic center, centers are, still, are shifting to other regions, such as the Ionian Islands and Crete, but also Venice itself, where an important Greek community is growing. During the 18th century, iconography centers are shifting even more towards villages and rural areas. This marks the transformation of iconography into folk art. In this way, the decline of iconography begins. The decline of, the decline of iconography just before the 20th century was not a local phenomenon. The same process followed in the other Orthodox countries. The lack of local education due, due to the Turkish domination leading the intellectuals to flee abroad and then adopt the Western culture. On the other hand, the, artist, the artists who lived in the country led to the, uh, led, led to the unconscious continuation of tradition and consequently to its downgrading. Gradually and in different way for every artist, Italian elements begin to be incorporated into Greek, creating a strange, a strange mixture of art. The Byzantine art had no large extent disappeared and the Western art took hold until the second half of the 20th century. Not until uh, 1940, the great Fortis Code of Luke, after superhuman struggles, managed to bring back to life the art of iconography uh, uh, and uh, to cultivate a climate of revival, predating tradition. He wrote, <coughs> the, 
he wrote the book uh, Ekphrasis and uh, gathered all the lost knowledge into volumes. This book was and still is the Holy Bible and the guide for all contemporary iconographers. During our times, the blooming of the Bazan studies, the researches for the Bazan art, the mythic session all created a favorable atmosphere. atmosphere. Contemporary artists, having finally gained the necessary knowledge, can and should, as an obligation, become guardians and undertake the creative continuation of the long tradition that is called the Byzantine Orthodox iconography. Have a look at the history, development, and the presentation of, iconograph of iconographic images around the world and through the centuries. We need to look also at the qualities of, of an icon, symbolism, and technique. The icon has as its purpose to transport us into the realm of the spiritual experience, to go beyond our material world, to show us the, the greatness and perfection of the divine reality that is, in, that is invisible to us. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through the icons. In describing the purpose of icons, the early fathers used the Greek word anagogic, literally meaning leading one upward. Photius Codoglu, the renowned Greek iconographer, expressed this perfectly, saying, Icons raise the soul and mind of the believer who sees the icon to the realm of the spirit, of the incorruptible, of the kingdom of God, as far as this can be achieved with material means. So to appreciate iconography fully, we must approach it as a liturgical art form whose function is essentially spiritual. The Pastan Orthodox iconography is not just an art, it is a sacred art. It is not faith, it is theology. It is not artistic expression, it is expectation of salvation. It is not decoration, it is a meeting with the divine. It is not a picture, it is communion with Christ. The icon is a stairway that lifts us up in heaven and brings down heaven to earth. It is a meeting place of created and uncreated, of divine and cosmic. Time does not exist. Past, present, and future exist in the internal now. Iconography is an art with its own artistic philosophy and its own artistic values that remain stable and unchanging over time. The art obeys a visual system with specific rules and principles that govern all periods, periods of its long course. Iconographers do not ever serve iconography as artists by the meaning given by the Western view of the world, but as mediums. Uh, mediums. Saint Photius says that the art of iconography is inspired by God and the hand of iconographer is moved by divine grace. And all marvelous works that have been achieved by iconographers of all times is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's why all iconographers sign their works writing by the hand of the iconographer is not simply an artist that creates a picture depicting some religious things, but has a spiritual wordiness and spiritual diaconate which he performs in the church as does the priest in the picture. His work resembles that of a priest. As Saint Theodosius the, says, one composes the blood of Christ and the other one presents it. Iconography is a religious act. The artist's mission is by using his artistic intervention to transform everything that presents into spirit and to touch the souls of the believers with his work. Since the creation of an icon is itself a sacred activity, the iconographer must be a person of prayer, not merely a technician. Condoglu writes, the iconographers painted as they pray. The iconography does not replicate nature. Its purpose is not, is not to faithfully accomplish a visual phenomenon. The painter borrows effects and shapes from nature and modifies their form, shape, size, and color. Objects placed, placed in the image 
no Lord and the icon, the icon no Lord just of no Lord no longer obey the laws of nature but the spiritual law. The portray the portrayal of spiritual truths cannot be done with natural natural and naturalistic way. In the Western approach to sacred art, such as those from the Renaissance, the artist the artist most frequently depicts his subjects in a purely naturalistic style. He uses the same techniques as he would as he would to depict a secular subject. The theme may be religious, but the style remains the same. As the goal of the iconographer is utterly different, so as ar- so uh, as as the goal of iconography is, is utterly different, so are his techniques to accomplish this goal. Iconography iconography depicts Christ and <coughs> and the saints not as they were in actual life, but as they are in eternity. He communicates his vision of the heaven of the of the heavenly world, not iconographer communicates his vision of the heavenly world not through symbols such as sunsets with golden clouds or angels playing harps but through mystical thoughts and colors. As Kondoglu writes, iconography expresses with spiritualized forms abstracted from natural phenomena a world which is beyond phenomena, a spiritual world. According to the Orthodox tradition, iconography does not target a realistic depiction of a person, but has primarily spiritual semiology since through this can be achieved a lifelong relationship with with God and his saints. Byzantine icon creates a sense of light presence and brings the believer in personal relationship and contact with the reality of the depicted. Even nature itself is transformed by the hand of the iconographer. Buildings, mountains, trees, and animals are usually depicted in a very simplified way rather than attempting to render a photographic likeness. Everything in an icon, even inanimate objects, must acquire spirituality and transform it into spirit. A form of transformation is required. The world within within iconography is presented as brilliant, glorious, revolved, and indestructible. The three-dimensional world of the five senses is tangible. The world of iconography is clean, bright, and blessed, glorious and glorious. The attrition and flows of the current fallen nature disappear in the light. The blessedness and glory is not only for the for the saints, for the saints. All nature, trees, mountains, birds, and everything take take part in this bliss. The attrition has departed and all things have undergone a change. The face of Christ and Mother of God and saints are not depicted in a natural way. Their faces do not resemble mere human beings, but through stylization they show us the faces of human nature transformed into the divine. The Bajdan iconographer does not look for a human model to paint the Christ or Mother of God. The iconographer respects the physical feature of the saint, but he paints all methods in such a way as to emphasize most of his holiness. The icon therefore depicts each person as a new being who has been restored to God's image and likeness. For this, the icon is able to become an object evoking contemplation and prayer from the one who views it. That's why faces in icons do not look such as human ordinary faces. Icons are also silent. A close observation indicates that the mouths of the characters depicted are never open. There are no symbols that can indicate sound. There is perfect silence in the icon, and this, and this stillness and silence creates both in the church and in, and, and in the home an atmosphere of prayer and contemplation. The silence of an icon is a silence that speaks. 
It is the silence of Christ on the cross, the silence of the present, the silence of the transfiguration, the silence of resurrection, resurrection. Natural objects are depicted in a symbolic, sometimes an abstract manner, because spiritual reality cannot be represented in images except through the use of symbols. As an example, the icon of the baptism of, of, of the Lord depicts Christ as a young man, and his body is depicted as strong and beautiful, even though he was a full mature man at the time of his baptism in the, in the Jordan. The meaning is that through, through baptism we enter a new life. The icon of the baptism also answer, answers the question of John the Baptist, the, uh, the question of John the Baptist. I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? The answer is what Jesus does with his hands. Whilst in Western art, like this painting at the left, by painted by Leonardo da Vinci, Jesus saw, saw Jesus is shown as submitting to John to John's authority. In Orthodox icons, Christ's hands are not shown in a prayer, but in a sign of blessing. Rather than the waters of Jordan cleansing Christ, it is Christ who cleans the waters. This is why in the bottom of most, uh, uh, most uh, theophany icons, little creatures appear to be clean from the feet of Christ. Also, in this cycle of the baptism, we see an old man and a woman. The old represents the old, uh, the old uh, Jordan River and the woman, the sea. This is a reflection of the words of the psalmist regarding the Messiah. The sea saw a flood and the Jordan turned back. In Bison icons, there are no shadows caused by sunlight, such as in Western religious fabrics of Renaissance. There are no shadows behind the buildings, behind human bodies, objects, trees. Shadows are created by the existence of an external source of light. By why aren't there any shadows? Shadows exist whenever there is a source of light. Light comes from the source and leaves a shadow on the ceiling, a shadow on the street, the shadow of the lamp. There is a, there is a source of light from, from where light comes from. If the light is everywhere, if, li if the light comes from all quarters and it comes from everywhere, then can be no shadow. The shadow is the evil. Everything is light. All are bright and lucid because it is illuminated by the light of God's kingdom. So you will never see dark areas in Basra icon. You will never see any darkness. Even though historically the event took place during the night, it is depicted full of light as if it was day. That's why you will never see shadows of bodies on the ground or the garments and faces. In the material world of five senses, all objects receive passively the sunlight. Some surfaces are illuminated and some others remain in shadow. Let's observe now the face of Christ. His face is illuminated by the uncreated divine light. The uncreated light emanates from the center of the eye in radial and all circular light rays. The source of the light is located in the center of the face and specifically in the eyes. The uncreated light coming out of his eyes radially, radially or in circular motion is spreading throughout the face. We can also see the uncreated divine light uh, in objects and other, in, in garments and other objects in the form of light rays. Another outstanding uh, feature of iconography 
is the extreme stylization and non-naturalistic depiction of the clothing on the figures. The folds of the clothes are depicted by means of geometric forms demonstrating a heavenly order. The light shines illuminating all parts of the image with geometric schematization. The unusual, the unusual natural geometric lighting creates a feeling of exogenous and transcendental glow. An atmosphere which alters the visual existence. In iconography, an illuminated surface is divided into smaller geometric shapes. <coughs> Another basic principle of the Bayesian iconography is that it does not describe the events with a conventional view of time and space. The icon keeps the historical elements but is not bound by them. God is out of space and time. Space and time are human creation. Time in Bayesian iconography is not calculated in the strict sense. Sometimes in the same icon are joined elements that are spaced in time. A typical example is the icon of the nativity. This principle appears thunderously enough on the nativity icon and has to do with the description of the events. Looking at this icon, we find that so many events from different times occurring simultaneously. As you see, <coughs> all events are described here. We see the Virgin Mary, <coughs> the midwives bathing the child Jesus, the angels announcing the Savior's birth to the shepherds, the, wise, the three wise men coming to adore the Messiah, Joseph, who is wondering about his pregnancy and has doubts about her, shepherds conversing with Joseph. Many events that took place at different times are shown, like, are shown in one moment. All events of timelessness gathered over here. In the iconography, time abolished and everything becomes eternity. We see that the child We see that the child, instead clothes, we see that the child, instead clothes, wears linen burial shroud. It is the linen burial shroud that Christ was wrapped with at the time of his deposition when he was taken to the church. It is the burial shroud that the mayor, be, uh, the, uh, the, mayor, the mayor bearing women found wrapped in the tomb. In the nativity icon, he is the child destined to die for us. Thus, this child that is born now prepares to be crucified and die for us. And he shows the taking of death upon him with the linen burial shroud that he is wrapped with in the manger. Simultaneously, the bed which he is, which he is put, is a tomb. It is a tomb in which Christ entered in order to resurrect. It is not any bed. For the historians, this depiction of the nativity is unhistorical because it never happened in this way. But for the Bible, iconography is theologically correct. For this, you cannot put on Christ any other clothes but the clothes of him who is preparing to die and resurrect. Let me mention another uh, example so you can understand how this happens. This is it, uh, the icon of Annunciation of Christ 40 days after his resurrection. Here you see the Mother of God up front the apostles all around. Uh, that is how the events took place, and fine up to here. However, we see something which is paradox. Up front here <coughs> is Apostle Paul, 
who Apostle Paul at the time of the ascension was not even a Christian. If you read the text of the Acts of the Apostles, the story of the ascension is described in the third chapter. The Apostle Paul sees the light in Damascus and repents in chapter 9. So according to uh, the history, the icon, this icon of ascension is unhistorical, but for the Orthodox iconography is not. As long as Paul repents, he gains the previous time. The penitent regains lost time. In Orthodox iconography, we never say Paul was not there. He was since he repented. One of the main characteristics of Byzantine iconography is the reversed perspective and the lack of the third dimension, which is death. But what is perspective in painting? Perspective is a trick for creating an illusion of three dimensions, height, width, and depth, on a two-dimensional flat surface. Perspective is what makes the objects in a painting seem to be distant. Perspective in Western art is often called linear perspective and was developed in the early or 15th century. When a painting shows the depth of the space, then the closest objects lo look larger and the distant objects look smaller. The three-dimensional perspective that has played such an important role in Renaissance painting for the Bazar iconographers was seen as a major obstacle for the spiritual expression. In Bazar icons, there are only two dimensions, height and width, there's no depth. Let's take a look again at the image of the baptism of Christ. The left image is a Western, a Western uh, painting of Renaissance, and the right is a Bazar icon. In the left image, we see distant objects, mountains, trees, lost in, into the artwork. In the right image, all these have been replaced with a blue background. The painting's depth has been removed. An object or a person who is painted in, three, in a three-dimensional perspective is so real, so standalone. He does not need anything else. It exists it's in, it, in its own time space. It's like a photo taken at a specific time in which the viewer cannot partake. In Bajran iconography, the third dimension, the depth is missing. The icon is incomplete and doesn't work. Actually cannot work without the presence of the viewer. The believer, the believer who stands in front of the icon feels the lack of depth. Of depth. He becomes the depth and participates in the function of the whole world. Actually, he becomes part of the world. The lack of depth, as well as the applying of the reverse perspective, was a drawing trick that the Bajdan iconographers invented in order to achieve communication between the depicted saint and the viewer. In the popular Basel culture, the subject of an icon is not a passive event that stands in front of the viewer in its own space-time. Instead, it is, an, it is an energetic event which moves toward the viewer and asks from him uh, uh, similarly to move in order to meet him. This, is, this motion is a key feature of the Basel artistic tradition. Bajdan iconographers applied the reverse perspective on buildings, mountains, people, creating many paradoxes that violate the drawing rules of painting. For example, they reverse the perspective of buildings and objects, painting the background of the subject larger than the foreground. If we extend the lines of the building, they come out of the painting surface and move toward the viewer. In this way, all lines are moving out of the interior of the interior of the painting and are moving into con and are coming into contact with the viewer. Actually, look at this picture because if you can see the reverse perspective, if we extend the lines, 
then all lines are meeting out of the artwork. And the vanishing point is out of the artwork. The vanishing point is the viewer. So everything in an icon, living and non-living things tend to come out of the artwork and meet the viewer. The Byzantine painters draw the subject so that even the garments of saints acquire eternal energy and uh, and the eternal energy. Everything in an icon, living and non-living things tend to come out of the artwork and meet the viewer. Another big difference between the religious paintings of the Renaissance of the West and Bys uh, another big difference between the religious paintings of the West and Byzantine icon is that the size of the depicted figures these do not follow the rules of natural perspective. According to the natural perspective, what is in the foreground of the painting is depicted big, even if it's something trivial, and what is in the back or the background is depicted small, even if it's the mother of God, for example. The size in iconography, the size of the depicted person is not dependent on how distant they are from us, but by the holiness. Uh, a few words about the symbolism of uh, the garments of Christ and, Ma and Virgin Mary. Uh, the purple colors of the inner garment of Christ symbolizes his divine nature, and the blue color of the outer garment symbolizes his human nature. With his left hand, Christ holds the gospel, suggesting that he is the founder of the New Testament. Right hand, bless, symbolizing, symbolizing his high priesthood. Around the finger of Christ, shining gold, symbol of the unapproachable light of divinity. The hand surrounded by halo, symbol of his holiness and participation of the Holy Spirit. Inside the halo, we distinguish uh, the cross, the instrument by which Christ redeemed the world. On the cross is written the, the three Greek letters, O, O, which means the existence. These letters derive from the Greek verb to be. A literal translation of these letters would be the being one, which does not mean, mean much. He who is is a better translation. These words are the answer Moses received on the mountain Sinai when he asked from the man of him to whom he was speaking. The halo around the hands of Christ and the Virgin Mary and the saints are painted in a clearly delineated cipher, signifying their sanctity and drawing out their attention to their faces. If you look at the clothes of the uh, Holy Mother, they can be seen to have exactly the opposite clothes of Christ. The inner garment is blue, which symbolizes, as we said, the human nature. The outer garment is purple, or a deep red, which means that the grace of God came from out to Mary. Whenever the Holy Mother is, push, is portrayed, Uh, she must always have always on her hand and two soldiers three small stars these three stars mean that she was a virgin before, during and after her pregnancy this expresses perpet perpetual virginity and let's finish by looking at this icon at this icon, uh, this uh, here we see one of the most profound theological icons of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the icon of Christ Padukratum from the second monastery of St. Catherine on the Mount Sinai. Uh, the word Padukratum is, is Greek meaning ruler of all. The most singular aspect of the word, of uh, the most singular aspect of this icon 
is that the two halves of Christ's face express different emotions. On the side on which he, go, he holds the gospel, his features are hard and severe, representing Christ as a judge who sees all, while the expression on the side with the, with the blessing hand is calm and serene, representing Christ on his role of shepherd. About information. Yes, for information. Did anyone have any questions for me? Mm -hmm. Is there? If I can answer, yes, why not? Mm -hmm. so well, no, but they might buy tomorrow, so they never know. <coughs> What is this one called? What do you mean? The, the name of this icon is? Yeah. It's uh, the icon of, Pri of Christ, but the grant of the monastery of uh, St. Catherine the Second uh, in the uh, of the mountain Sinai. Thank you.